shelters for folks looking for housing. There is a lot of that going on right now. Housing is, is crazy expensive. Um, I, I know of several folks who had apartments and moved out on their own um, and then have come back home because apartment prices have doubled and salaries haven't. So uh, um, prayers for, for those folks and for them to find a, a place in this community. Are there other prayer concerns this day? Thank you, David. And uh, when we do the passing of the peace, somebody bring me one of those inserts so I'm not up here just singing watermelon. Uh, I didn't, didn't get that when I brought the bulletins in. Let us now turn. Oh, gotcha. Thank you, David. Let us now turn our hearts and minds to worshiping God. One in the responsive call to worship, come weary one, for God is in this place. Come restless one, for God is in this place. Come hopeful one, for God is in this place. Come curious one, for God is in this place. God is in me, and God is in you. So in every place, in this place, God is here. Please stand as you're able and sing number hymn number 466, over a thousand tones to sing. <laughs> confession. God invites us to a real relationship, a place where we are honest with ourselves, others, and God. Let's start here, confessing the uncomfortable truth of our sins together. You join in the unison prayer, prayer of confession. If we say we have no sin, we are not being honest, and the truth is not in us. Therefore, we confess our true selves that we have often ignored our privilege, even as we benefit from it. That we have not listened to the pain of others, but have instead dismissed it to keep ourselves comfortable. That we have not done the hard work 
of belonging to each other. We also confess that we are better than this. Our sin is not all we are. With your help, God, we can change, we can listen, we can heal and bring healing to others. We confess this possibility in the name of the one who makes all things possible. Please continue in silent prayer. Assurance of pardon. We belong to God. We belong to each other. God does not look at us and see only sin. God sees belovedness. Believe that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. In ways we may never fully understand, this is good news. Please join me in our statement of faith in a time of uncertainty. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator, ignoring God's commandments. We violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. Prayer for illumination. Soften us, God, so that we may approach your word without pride or rigidity. Show us, Jesus, what it means to belong to each other and to you. Stir us up, Spirit, that these words may be made incarnate in our lives. Amen. Our readings today from the Old Testament, Psalm 8, 1 through 9. O oh Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants you have founded a bulwark because of your foes. To silent the enemy, silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at our, your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little slower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, also, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, what other passes along the paths of the seas. Our Lord Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth.
Our reading from the New Testament is from Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love had been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, you who are our strength and our redeemer. In Christ, amen. So in writing a sermon... One of the things my dad, who has been doing sermon writing for more than than 30 years now, reminds me of repeatedly is that those in preparing to discuss a text must go through a process of, of scholarly work known as form criticism. Now, now that's a fancy term for breaking the the text down into time periods and genres and authors and themes in order to understand what 18th century Protestant scholars who first systematically really did this called the the Sitz im Lieben or the Sitz im Volksleben. Now, my dad likes to remind me to do this because he's been doing it so long, he can do it without thinking. But, but, but he knows that, that in spite of my gray hairs, that this is somewhat new for me still. And I just think he likes to add a little more pressure to my work. But it is important in, in, in biblical criticism, the, the Sitz in Liebem or the, the Sitz in Volksleben are, are German phrases that, that roughly translate to setting in life or, or the setting in life of the people. A, a seminary textbook would say these terms describe the work of analyzing the context in which a text or object has been created and its function and purpose at the time. The Sitz in Lieben is also used to refer to the social, ethnic, and cultural setting of a site at a particular era. In other words, when you interpret an item or a text, you have to look at when it was used, when it was written, the region, the place, the location. You have to put it in its proper context. Thus, scholars, writers, and preachers cannot be too quick to look at a text and immediately put it in our modern context. You need to take the time to understand the original intent I I want to give you a a quick example involving one of the most misused and misunderstood books of the Bible and and one that I, I generally avoid preaching from, the book of Revelation. Based upon scholarly research and, and historical analysis, today modern biblical scholars look at Revelation in its first century context and within the the genre of the Jewish and Christian communities at the time. It's both apocalyptic and poetic literature. And when you look at it in its modern context, it's clear that, that Revelation is meant to address 
seven particular historical Christian communities in Asia Minor who were under attack from the Emperor Nero. It's coded language. It's used to, to make assertions. And when it talks about the time being near, they're literally talking about the time being near. And when it talks about the persecution of the church, it's talking about Nero persecuting the church in a very clear and present danger of the time. Consequently, revelation as a work it is to be viewed as a warning to that particular group of people, but also as a way for us to look at how these people dealt with the threat of the empire, which John unveils as a beastly demonic demon that was out to give judgment. And he wrote it in a way to keep the people safe by never using Nero's name in the writing, but also praying for God to bring healing and wholeness and safety to the community. In other words, Revelation can be learned from both as a historical work and an example of the early church's witness under duress. And it has very little to do, I, I hate to tell some of the preachers, with, with world-ending apocalypses that, that many people have pointed it to without any real study of Revelation. It has very little to do with the, the end times, which they have pointed to in order to separate what they call the sheep from the goats and get everybody right with God. Instead, I think much of, of that kind of preaching has done little to bring the world together and more to divide us apart. In fact, and I didn't know this until I was doing some of that form criticism my dad talks about, the great John Calvin, the, the theologian upon whom Presbyterianism is founded, wanted to rip Revelation right out of the New Testament. He wrote all kinds of commentaries on every book of the Bible except the book of Revelation. He thought it would be used to divide people who didn't understand its context and do the research. It might be used to manipulate society. And that it was really a letter just intended for those seven Asia Minor churches. I share this not to, to spark or create a debate on the book of Revelation, which, which is a study for another day, and, and frankly not a, a sermon, and it's certainly not a sermon series you're going to be hearing from me anytime, to, anytime in the near future, but I use it as a necessity to continually be reformed and studying the text and the scripture. <laughs> and understanding its text and scripture's context and meaning. Thus, when I look at Paul's words here, there's a necessity to look at that, that context, the sits and libum. Now, Romans, Romans is the first letter of Paul in the New Testament, but it's not the first letter to be written. Paul actually wrote this letter much later in his ministry to, to the church or the community of churches in Rome. It, it was a church that, that were Christians, both of Jewish descent and Gentiles. And the letter, while, while deep and theological, the, its primary theme is the good news of salvation, which is meant for all people. The epistle is unusual, however, because Paul is writing to a church he's never visited. He only hopes to visit in the future. And in it, Paul notes these Christians and their suffering in Rome. It's a suffering that I'm not sure we fully can understand in our modern context. What do I mean? 
Well, I think it's important to note that the people of Rome, the people of Rome were generally tolerant of most religions. A lot like us in the United States today. But, but there was one exception. They were tolerant of polytheistic religions only. And all of those polytheistic religions had to include the Roman emperor of the time as one of their deities. Oh, you could worship whatever other deities you wanted as long as you included the emperor as one of your deities. That was a problem with the Christian church. It was a problem with the Jewish community as well because both Christians and Jews were fiercely monotheistic. There is only one God. And that was an unpopular doctrine in the Roman Empire, especially when they refused to worship the emperor or acknowledge him as any kind of deity, seeing him only as human. <coughs> because of this, Christians and Jews experienced intense persecution. For example, the Roman Emperor Claudius banished all monotheists from the city of Rome in 49 AD. Get out. That lasted until Claudius' death five years later. But, but when they returned, the Christian and Jewish community began to experience even greater persecution under the emperor Nero. He was a brutal and perverted man who harbored an intense like for Christians in particular. Indeed, it is known that during Nero's rule, after he caught Christians, he enjoyed setting them on fire to provide light for his gardens and parties at night. The Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans during the reign of Nero, when Christian persecuting persecution was occurring. Amazingly, that persecution continued, and it even got worse over, over another emperor later in the first century, Emperor Domitian. Though we don't mention him as much, Nero gets all the fame. In other words, the suffering and persecution of these Christians had a meaning that you and I can't imagine. Now, other than Laura over there, none of you in this room, I bet, know the Reverend Kyler Smith. He was a PCUSA minister, and at one time he was the pastor of the Ackworth Presbyterian Church just down the road a bit. Later in his ministry, he worked part-time as, as a parrot associate at my dad's church as he entered the retirement phase of his life. We got to know each other during during his time there at my dad's church, I, I was a youth a couple of years, and, and then in college, he, he actually helped conduct Laura and I's wedding service along with my dad. And, and on a side note, to show you what a small world it was, his grandson actually grew up with our girls Sydney graduated with him, and, and he's in a lot of prom and fancy dress photos in his tuxedo that, that are all over our house. But Kyler tells a story. He tells a story of working with this youth group in, in, in Ackworth and, and a study he did of the, the early church with them and what it was like to be an early Christian in Rome. Now, now you got to go back with me. This was probably the late 1970s he was doing this. It, it was a different 
time, and Ackworth was a different city than what you remember now. Kyler tells the story sort of like this. At the concluding activity, after they had studied all about what it was like to worship in secret and what worship services were like and the fact that they were a fellowship with a meal and service and prayer, but they had to be done in secret. They got a map on a Sunday night with passwords for these youth to follow throughout the city of Ackworth that eventually landed them in the basement of a house on Lake Ackworth where they worshiped in candlelight. They had the dates and the nuts and the unleavened bread, and as they were going about the worship service, the city of Ackworth's version of Sheriff Taylor and Deputy Fife raided the worship service, arresting the entire youth group walking them the five or six blocks up Main Street to the little city jail where he put them all in jail for worshiping an illegal God. The parents were waiting in the lobby next door, bailed all of their kids out of jail where they were been scared to death and then brought them back to church for for a debriefing and pizza and, and, and Presbyterian punch, I imagine. The idea was to give these kids just a tiny feeling, a glimpse of what it would be like to be afraid to worship, and a small glimpse of the fear of the early church. Of course, this was only a peek into the fear and the suffering of those in the early church. Because in the real first century church, they lived in constant fear of arrest and imprisonment and torture and even death. Thus, Paul's words that we heard here in Roman have even more more profound meaning. Hear them again. We know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now when I read these words, I must admit, I struggle with Paul's words here, uh, especially at first glance and first reading. You see, I struggle with suffering being something that God gives us as some sort of a test. And as I struggle with them and come up against the words of of Paul today, I I sometimes get to the part where I'm arguing with Paul. I, I, I mean, I love the poetry of them. I yearn for them to be true, but but I also believe that there's a whole lot of suffering in this world that has no redemptive value to it at all. And I'm glad Paul doesn't say all suffering. You see, sometimes... Sometimes I look on suffering as something that just breaks us down. And I can't say that all suffering is good. And parts of the Bible agree with me on this. In fact, there's a whole book, the book of Job, that that says sometimes suffering is just that. It's suffering. And yet, I'm stuck with these words. These words that say suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character hope, and hope does not disappoint. And yet, it doesn't always ring true. Or at least they don't if we look at them through our Western cultural lens which defines suffering and redemption as that that happens in the lives of individuals 
and not the shared lives of community. You see, if we read these words just as individuals, asking how they are meant just for us, we struggle. But Paul, Paul is writing to a community here. And yes, yes, I had to go back to the Greek once again, but all of the words Paul uses are plural versions of the words. Paul's words are not meant to address me as an individual or you as an individual. Instead, they are all the shared we form of the words. I think you can sometimes use the words above that Paul wrote and apply them to individuals, but Paul is actually speaking in the plural. Take another look with me. Paul writes in this text, we are justified. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to the grace in which we stand. We boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, we boast in our sufferings because our hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Yes, much suffering happens individually, but the promise Paul extends today is grounded in God's people being together in this. In other words, our suffering is a group project. And if you've ever done a group project in school, you know that can be some pretty intense suffering in and of itself. So perhaps Paul's words are not really meant to address the sort of suffering that we sometimes think about. Like when I think of suffering, sometimes I'm I'm stuck thinking about it individually. I, I, I remember about six and a half years ago, I went through a day of suffering like none other. I, I, I was at work and I was hurting. I couldn't figure out what it was that was hurting my back. It hurt worse and worse and worse throughout the day. I I, I tried to make it feel better. I, I went up and hid. I remember this. I hid behind the stage of the curtains during lunch duty. We, we have one of those cafetoriums, you know, the, the stage is up there and I was supposed to be on, and I was hurting. I went and hid behind the stage like I was doing something important. I bent over in pain. By the end of the day, I wanted somebody to shoot me. I headed to the doctor's office. Now, I didn't call anybody to ask for help. That would be silly. You know, I'm a John Wayne kind of guy. That that would have been ridiculous. Instead, I got to the doctor's office, and and they did some intake work, and and then they put me in the room to wait for the doctor's office. You you, you know how you doctors do. You think you're going to be seen right away, but they're in there playing Miss Pac-Man. I'm sure of it. And they said, I said, I think I need to go to the restroom. And they said, oh, no, we we need a urine sample. Don't go. We need to wait for the doctor, though, to order the test. The doctor, after 17 and a half hours, finally came in to order the test. I went in, and and, 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 and you've had to give a urine sample. I won't go into all the details, but but, but I I had had the little cup there. And as I began to, to pass the urine, I came and saw a vision of the Lord and nearly passed out. Later, the doctor described it as the largest kidney stone they had ever seen somebody pass naturally. I didn't think there was something, anything natural about it. Friends, that suffering wasn't a suffering that produced anything but pain. I don't think that's what Paul is talking about here. I sure hope not. 
Instead, if I understand the text, I believe Paul's words are meant to speak to the sort of suffering that we do on behalf of and in support of one another. The kind of suffering that Christ did, not for himself, but on behalf of the entire world. I believe that's the kind of suffering which leads to endurance and character and the kind of hope that doesn't disappoint. I can't pretend to to tell you that this is something easy to understand and embrace, especially not in the culture where we have learned since birth that we are to view human experience through the eyes of the individual. You know, that rugged individualism that they talk about in school. And yet, I want you to know I've discovered something about each of you. Each of you are subversives. Did you know that? Because in an act of rebellion against the world, you choose to gather as a community. You choose to gather as a community, as a we. You believe in the power of coming together, in the power of community in the belief that as a beloved community, we can do things for God. And so Sunday after Sunday, you and I as a we stand alongside one another who have experienced something about the love of God poured out into our individual hearts, and we choose to share that and worship that corporately. Time after time, we receive the promises of God's proclaimed word spoken, and in the breaking of the bread and the wine poured, again and again, we hear the call to join together as followers of Christ around the world, to love all just as Jesus did and does. It's why we sing corporate hymns. Some of you, some of you I've heard you sing. Some of you are better than others. We could go and find paid soloists to come in. I I think Covenant College has a music program. We we probably could go and get some paid soloists to come in. That they, They would sing better than all of us together. But there's something about voices lifted together as we that bring comfort. And in those times when we struggle and suffer and fail as individuals, it is the church community, the we who hold each other up as we work together to endure and grow and find hope even in the dark days. Friends, I believe that to be true. In our shared journey, we experience together a struggle, which together leads us to the strength Paul talks about and the promise that fills us with the kind of hope which is grounded in the real experience of God's presence today, not in this building, but in the people who occupy it. And there's this too. While we don't know the sufferings of those Romans in the early Christian community, we all have our own struggles, don't we? We live in hard times. We say we are coming out of a pandemic, and oh, I pray it's true. But the truth is, we've said that before before another strain came along and we were suddenly all back in mask again. And I do know we live in a world where suffering is a reality for far too many people. Too many people will go to bed tonight grieving the loss of a loved one through, through senseless violence especially violence involving guns. And we live in a world where too many have to choose between feeding themselves 
and feeding their families or paying the rent or getting their medication. And we live in a world of suffering that stress of life pushes too many to abuse drugs and alcohol. We live in hard times. And the truth of this text is that the only way that we can get through it is through the power of we together. That's what Paul was pointing to when he talked about the church suffering and then enduring and finding hope together. I believe if we model this and invite those around us to join in our lives together, we will be able to live out the poetry of Paul's words because in our human love for one another, we experience empathy when folks suffer and we are changed by this. We are changed and our eyes are open and our wills are bent to love evermore and to make a difference in the world so that fewer and fewer people have to walk through this world alone. Because so much of the damaging behavior happens because people are alone, because they're lonely. You hear of the random shooters and their destructive behaviors, and what they tell you is this. They say they were a loner that means is they were lonely. They were longing for a community. And friends, that's what we in the church can provide as we come together to love others as God loves us so that they can experience suffering, but a suffering that produces endurance, an endurance that produces character and character that gives hope and friends, hope from our Savior never disappoints. I told you earlier about Kyler's church youth group. It's funny, about 15, 20 years later, I was sitting at a dinner. Well, it wasn't a dinner. It was a lunch. We were having all five Presbytery of Georgia. They came together for a leadership event came together to Atlanta. That was exciting back then. People from Moultrie to get to come to the big city. Oh, it was, it was a big event, so we, we had to have it at, at, at a big place. So we went to this little old church in Atlanta called Peachtree Presbyterian Church. It, it takes up about four and a half city blocks, I think. It, it was a little church where, where Dr. Frank Harrington was the pastor at the time, Anyway, that church is a little bit larger than our church. I think they have about 8,000 members. We're close. Some were very similar to that. And we had a day and a half long conference, and of course, we had to have lunch. Get Presbyterians together, they got to have coffee and they got to eat. So I was sitting at the table. We were, we were sitting with people from our own Presbyterian, and we were playing the, the Presbyterian game of who do you know that I might know in the church? You discover what a false, small world it is. Anyway, one of the people sitting there, they, they were no longer a member of the Ackworth Church. They, they were a member of the Covenant Church, but, but they mentioned that they knew Kyler just like I did. And as ho happened, he was a member of that youth group that was arrested in the city of Ackworth. He told the story to the whole table about sneaking into the dark basement of what probably now would be a half million dollar house on Lake Ackworth, about eating terrible unleavened bread and dates and nuts and figs only thing he said he really recognized were some of the raisins. He were talked about the worshiping and then getting arrested by Barney and, and Sheriff Taylor. As he told it, the yarn got larger and larger, and my side was hurting from so much laughter. 
At the end, I remember someone asking him if they were really scared. He said he was an 11-year-old and there was a police officer shining a flashlight in his face. Yes, he was scared. But then he said something that has stuck with me to this day. He said, I knew though I was going to be all right because I was there together with my church youth group. When we struggle, when we really struggle, aren't we all comforted by not being alone? By being surrounded by those who know and love us just as we are. Oh, friends, Paul is right. We are justified. We have peace through God and through our Lord and Savior. We have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing in the glory of God. And not only that, we boast in our sufferings, and our hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The promise of this text that extends today is grounded in God's people being in this together as a group project. As I was thinking back on, on old times and old youth groups this way, week, I, I remembered an old songbook that we had in youth group. Now, now you just shoot up there on PowerPoint for people to sing the lyrics, but it, but it was an old brown songbook. You had to have one of them that had the guitar chords so that somebody who could sort of play the guitar could play it at youth group, and then a bunch of other brown songbooks. I, I, I looked it up to see if I could remember the name of the book on, you can find anything on Google, it's amazing. The name of the songbook was Songs. It was compiled by Johann Anderson, and it had a distinctive symbol of the Christian fish on the bottom corner of it. Later, the second edition was more of a green color. You know that green color that was once in everybody's home in shag carpet? You remember what I'm talking about. That was the second edition of the book. I almost ordered it on eBay. Except we have too many books in our house as it is, so I didn't. In that book, though, was a song we sang quite often, a song entitled, We Are the Family of God, whose lyrics I still remember. I didn't have to look that up. It says, we are the family of God. Yes, we are the family of God. And he's brought us together to be one in him that we might bring light to the world. Oh, may it be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ. Amen. Friends, having heard the good news and the good news proclaimed, let us confess that which we believe using the Apostles' Creed found on the inside cover of your hymnal. As you are able, let us stand and say that which we believe together. What do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, we are called to hold the gifts we have been given with hands open, ready to share them. We do not hoard or hold tightly to what we own because we do not own much, but borrow it for a time. Let us give from a place of abundant love and mindful care, knowing with God there is more than enough.
Will you join me in the unison prayer of dedication? Let us pray. Use these gifts, God, to do more than we could believe or imagine, building a world of justice and healing where there is enough for all. Amen. You may be seated. We come now to the prayers of the people in the Lord's Prayer. I did neglect two prayer requests earlier. One, I had a member of the congregation call with some private prayers for discernment and healing earlier in the week and would ask that you to keep those who have private concerns of their hearts in your prayers. Also, a prayer of thanksgiving and a warning to the Lafayette community. Anne is back on the road again. Watch out for your kids on the sidewalk and because uh, she is ready to go. We are grateful for her continued healing as she continues to go through physical therapy, but, but, it, but has got the keys to the car and permission to use it once again. So we are grateful for that. Let us go to God in prayer. Oh Lord, what does it mean that you are sovereign? Does it mean that you direct our days with a strong hand, marshalling us into obedience and servitude? Does it mean that creation is for your exercise of dominion, for you to show your power and might? Or maybe, maybe does your sovereignty mean something more like a pouring out, an emptying of the political words that do nothing, an emptying of religion that only serves to make a show of itself, to gain votes and money and power, an emptying of the very heavens themselves, raining down upon a worry, weary world with something like joy, an emptying of our theologies of safety and comfort that we may be filled with courage and creativity and be about building your kingdom an emptying of our borders of church walls and building projects from bottom lines so that we might remember what it really means to be your people, to do church, to live who we say we are in the moment, an emptying of our deep places of despair and fear and rage and insecurity so that we can build up others, that we can be an overflowing community with grace that cannot be contained. Oh God, may this be what your sovereignty is about, and may we welcome it. May we welcome you who birthed new worlds and new life. We pray that you will come and disrupt the patterns that neither serve you nor our neighbor. We welcome you to help us as we work to make your kingdom come on earth, even as it is as you promised already in heaven. In recognition of this hope that we pray, we pray in the way that your son taught us to pray, who teaching his disciples said we should pray saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 138, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. As you are able, let us stand and sing together.
as you go, go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold fast to what is good, return no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen.